Well, the Nashville Predators couldn't pull out a very, very stolen win. Uh, it's a 3-2 shootout loss to the Edmonton Oilers last night. We got your full game recap. Uh, plus, another big night for Philip Forsberg, now on pace to set some Predators history. We'll talk about that. Plus, why another player might have had their best game of the season despite the loss. And it's Friday, which means uh, your girl Anne has cookies for our Predators Player of the Week. All coming up today on Locked on Predators. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Friday, everybody. Thank you for making Locked On Predators your first listen of the day, as always. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor at OnTheForeCheck.com, and I have a partner in crime who is thanking God it's Friday. I am. I'm Ann Kimmel. I'm a writer at OnTheForeCheck.com. Yeah. Um, weird day for the Nashville Predators yesterday. Maybe even a weirder day for the Edmonton Oilers. <laughs> Uh, they pick up the same amount of hockey wins as they did PR nightmares yesterday. Ooh. That's an entire different conversation for another day that I don't want to talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the Edmonton Oilers beat the Nashville Predators three to two in a shootout. Uh, it's a weird game. Yes. I think that's probably the best way I can put it. A <laughs> uh, lot of kind of weird stuff going on throughout. Um, yeah, this is going to be a very interesting one word, Anne. Uh, yeah, this one word, this one really stumped me because it, this game was its own thing on so many levels. Uh, the best way to sum it up is it was a real hockey game, uh, back and forth. It was and a it, hockey game. It was a hockey game, a real one. <laughs> but when it comes down to it, you have to pick a one word. My one word is, of course, not one word because we don't have to play by the rules. We make the rules. Um, but it is a movie quote that sort of sums up the experience of watching that game. And it is from the Avengers movie uh, where one of my favorite Avengers, Iron Man, says to... Um, can't remember now who he says it to, but he says he's getting ready to take somebody and fly away with them. And he says, clench up like a loss. And I thought... Yep, that's about it. Like, that was what Hawkeye. that game experience. Hawkeye, that's yeah, it. Because he had the bow and arrow, like uh, Legolas from. That's right. Lord of the Rings. In my mind, I'm literally picturing Legolas. So yeah. there's where my movie crossover problems began. Um, but that was just my experience with this. I mean, it was really fast paced hockey. The Oilers came out and were playing really, you know, kind of very fast and the predators were a little bit maybe a, a beat behind but not really and you see sorrows faced a bunch of shots and you had that and then you had wait whoa you have that three on three overtime and you know that's a whole different level of energy and then oh now you have to bite your nails because we've got a shootout and it just literally was an exhausting experience uh it was a hockey game and i think that was definitely one that we all probably had needed to unclench some things by the time it was over <laughs> in your mind what was orlando bloom's better role lord of the rings or will turner from uh, pirates of the caribbean Okay, full disclosure, never seen Pirates of the Caribbean, any of them. Uh, wow, you have children. I, they've never seen them either. I don't know what's wrong with me. But in my defense, we have seen the Lord of the Ring. We've seen the Lord of the Rings movies all the way through multiple times. And I can't imagine that he is better as a pirate than he is as an elf. Oh, I disagree with that. Oh, okay. All no, right. You need to see Lord of the Rings. Uh, I have seen Lord of the Rings. I don't. The, the, only, the only knock on Pirates of the Caribbean, and we promise we'll talk about hockey here in a second, folks. Uh, <laughs> the, the only thing with Lord of the Ring, or I'm sorry, the only thing with Pirates of the Caribbean is the writing on the last movie is garbage. 
Yeah, well, the writing in all of the Lord of the Rings is great all the way through. So. That's, I think, the one key. Uh, yeah. The, maybe what gives the trilogy a little bit of edge. But he's great as Will Turner. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, hockey. Um, I'm actually going back to movies for my one word. It is the movie Dog Day Afternoon. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it is a 1975 uh, movie based on a true story uh, starring Al Pacino and John Casale, a.k.a. Fredo from The Godfather. Uh, uh -huh. So you have so you have the uh, Corleone boys reunited again. Uh, basically, they go in and they rob a bank in Brooklyn. Um, and then just throughout the course of the movie, just everything goes wrong during this robbery. Um, you know, everything starts falling apart. The walls start closing in and you're like, wow, this is this is something that they're definitely going to lose. Which you kind of thought from the Predators last night, uh, even though they had the one nothing lead at one point, you kind of just saw the way they started playing. And you're like, oh, this is this is going to wind up being a rough night, isn't it? But then. In Dog Day Afternoon, things kind of start bouncing the robber's way. Like, they suddenly start getting support from the people in the bank. They start finding all these little things that kind of give them the upper hand. It looks like they have the upper hand. And then by the end of the movie, you're like, oh, my God, they're going to get away with it. <laughs> Actually, like a robbery that they pull off, and that's kind of what I thought for the Preds, like going through that overtime. I actually thought this going into the shootout too, because mm -hmm. when the Predators survive that big rush from Edmonton at the end of the three on three, including the Darnell Nurse shot that went that beat Soros but went off the post. Yes. Like, okay, like Preds are pretty good in a shootout. They got this. Like they they survived. They stole a win. And then what happens in Dog Day Afternoon is there's this one FBI guy who was driving the car to the getaway plane. They did not check to see if he had a gun. And uh. at the last minute, like they pulled out, he pulled out the gun, shot one of the robbers. And then that was, that was it. That was movie over right there. And you're like, oh, they were so close. They just did one thing wrong. And that FBI agent with the gun was Connor McDavid. Yes. Just Ugh. that one very, very pretty shootout goal. Um, that's definitely going on uh, the shootout goal highlight reel of the year for the NHL, which sucks that Saros is going to wind up on it because this might have been UC Saros's best game of the season, which is weird when you look and notice it was a 3 2 shootout loss. Right. But the way he played. Some of those chances he stopped should go on his Vezina trophy reel. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, they showed a stat partway through the game of just sort of shot locations, a shot map. And you look at the high danger chances that UC Saros was facing and the saves that he was making. And what's so interesting to me is that there were a number, I mean, a significant number of high danger chances, but the game didn't feel like that because UC Saros was in that zone where he's making these really hard saves but he's making them look like they weren't great chances when they were. Um, I agree with you. I think this may be UC Saros's best game, and I'm offended deeply that they're going to show that uh, Connor McDavid shootout goal against UC Saros. Now, I have to say that was just – it was incredible, and I hate to be the – you know, I hate to be the guy that says something nice about the other guy. Yeah. That was incredible. <laughs> But I think UC Saros had, I agree with you, I think this was probably one of his best games, and he was making incredible saves through that, for sure. Yeah, 44 saves on 46 shots last night. Mm -hmm. You see the Edmonton total, like 46 shots, you kind of think, oh, you know, this is, they kind of just wanted to start putting pucks on net, a lot of shots from the point and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. No, like you mentioned, you go on naturalstattrick.com and look at the uh, the shot map from last night's game. The oh, yeah. bulk of those are just right in the slot or right around the net. Um, yeah. And so it's like you, you kind of realize it's like, okay, this is a game that easily could have been like 5 2, 6 2 Edmonton. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And the fact that Saros even gave the Predators a chance to win, 
that's that's pretty incredible. Like that is a big feather in his cap for him. Yes. Uh, so yeah, this this definitely goes on the the UC Saros Vezina highlight reel. Except that one goal, but otherwise, Except, yes. Well, I mean, even in that one goal's defense, that did bounce off like two different people. Oh, that yeah, like that twice. fluke goal. That fluke goal is hockey in a nutshell. I mean, there's just yeah. no there's you could have lined up ten UC Saros in in net and somehow that stinking puck was going to find its way and that was just a fluke that well, was crazy well it's crazy because it's like you know even one deflection throws a goaltender yeah. off so much you really like slow down the replay and off of that first deflection um and i'm not sure the predator it bounced off of but it like went off one of their skates sorrows tracked that i know like you saw the slow-mo and yeah. you could see like him, his body kind of like adjusting yep. to that first deflection. And if that, like that on its own is pretty incredible. Like if he was able to make that save, that's oh, another, yeah. word. wow. That's, that's one that could easily have gone haywire for the Preds. It just happened to take another deflection right in front of the crease. Right. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So but but still, I mean, that's that's how zoned in UC Saros was last night was even like a, a goal that you thought or a shot that you thought, OK, this is going to be a really tough one to stop. He was on it. Yes. So, so kudos to him for that. Yep. Yep. It was a great game. He was tracking everything. He was a dog with a bone on this game. Yeah. Well, more coming up from this game. Philip Forsberg, a inch closer to setting some Nashville Predators history. Also a big negative from the game last night that we have to get into. But first, though, one thing that's not a big negative is the great taste of Built Bar. Yep, Built Bar is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, so it's perfect for helping you stick to those New Year's resolutions, especially if you have a sweet tooth. Even though they're covered in 100% real chocolate, Built Bars are low in calories, low in sugar, low in net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. But that doesn't mean they don't taste great. Trust me, you're going to want to keep these around the house, uh, stash them in the home, the pantry, the office, wherever you kind of get cravings during the day. Uh, Built Bar is a hot, healthy option that uh, tastes great and helps you stick to your New Year's resolution. Plus, there is a flavor for almost every taste. There's coconut almond, peanut butter brownie, raspberry, cookies and cream, churro, that's one I want to try, Anne. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also an eggnog flavor, which we're kind of uh, debating whether it's <laughs> we we still want to try it or not now that it's past uh, Christmas time. Uh, and, and so many more. In fact, Built Bar is always coming out with new limited time flavors. So be sure you check out Built.com often to see what's new. And while you're there, use promo code LOCKED15 at checkout to get 15% off your order. Again, that is promo code LOCKED15, all one word, for 15% off at built.com. Yeah, Nashville Predators lose to the Edmonton Oilers 3-2 in a shootout. Uh, and got to say, one of the biggest down points last night, mm -hmm. the Predators' power play. Three chances, yes. zero shots on goal. Yeah, and you know what it concerns me almost the most about this is that I think it was an absolute classic uh, way. It is a classic example of how to thwart the Nashville Predators, and I'm really hoping other teams weren't watching. Edmonton played so aggressively on the kill. I mean, they were not going to give up an inch of ice in the neutral zone even. Um, and it seemed to completely flummox the Predators. They just couldn't seem to get it done. And it's frustrating because that's not the power play that I think that we're used to seeing them execute. So, yeah, the power play was, uh, yeah, that was a big disappointment in this game for sure. Yeah, especially against an Edmonton defense, an Edmonton special teams unit that, you know, wasn't great, although they've played better as a season yeah. gone on. Um, but yeah, that was that was definitely a weak point for the Oilers yeah. last night. 
And, you know, we, we talked about it. Like, that's your chance. We we talked about the Predators mm-hmm. um, just needing to get pucks on net. We talked about their goaltending not really being great this season. Although I thought Koskinen played a pretty solid game last night. He did. Um, but, but we talked about, you know, that being an issue. We talked about the Edmonton defense, not just the blue line, but, you know, kind of the team defense being a little shoddy in spots. Um, so that was your chance. Like the Predators just needed to get pucks on net. And that didn't happen, especially on special teams. Now, they finished with 30 shots, which is actually like pretty good. Pretty good. When I, I had, had to kind of go back and, and rethink the game a little bit when I saw that stat because I'm like, really? Because it seemed like the puck was in Edmonton zone the entire time. Um, but but yeah, it was just kind of one of those things where it's like it didn't feel like the Predators really put pressure on the Oilers for you know much of the night. It seemed like a lot of the the focus for the Preds was okay, let's just let's just survive. Yes. No, I would agree with that. And the other thing that I noticed, and I know that this is sort of part of the identity that the Predators talk about is the game began and it really felt like it was, you know, the Oilers controlling the tempo, controlling the pace and the Predators kind of surviving through it, like you were just saying. But as the Predators got more physical and I really feel like they began to wear Edmonton down. And so where you kind of started seeing that was towards the end of the game. And I think when they're playing that identity hockey, when, you know, you get to a point where the other team is like, you know what, that pucks against the boards and I'm not going to go super hard in there. And I think you kind of saw a little bit of that in this game. One of the other things that's been a little bit of a concern for me lately, Nick, and and maybe I'm wrong on this, is it seems like the herd line has gotten a little offensively quiet. Didn't seem Mm. like maybe it was Colton Sisson's best game. And we really haven't seen much offensive production from Jano and Yakov Trenin. And I was a little disappointed in that in this game last night. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit yesterday about wanting to see them step up a little bit. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and obviously, like, let's get this out there now. Like, we know scoring's not, like, Correct. their thing. Um, just having them score is a nice little added bonus for their style of play. But mm-hmm. I, I agree. It, it just seems like they've been a little bit quiet lately. Yes. Um, that they're not really having kind of the same high energy impact. Maybe that's different, you know, when, when you're at home playing in front of your big fans and you kind of see hear the crowd swell a little bit when you land a big mm-hmm. hit, a strong four check and force a turnover. Um, so maybe playing on the road a little bit is why they maybe seem quiet. Um, but just watching the game, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you don't really notice when someone's out there. Yeah. If that makes sense, you yeah. know, like, when when Forsberg and, and Granland and Duchesne are out there and Yossi's out there, you notice them because they usually always have the puck. Uh, they're usually just making like some good sustained chance. You're kind of anticipating that shot. Yeah. Uh, and, and I used to be able to see that earlier this year with the herd line. You know, you just knew there's a big check coming. You knew there's going to be like a mad scramble in front of the other team's net that led mm-hmm. to a couple of chances and i haven't kind of felt that from the herd line the past couple days um or the past couple games so yeah i mean i think you're onto something about them maybe being a little bit quiet yeah and it's one of those things where like you said you know that they're not you know we're not banking on them for a majority of scoring but they're the kid that brought home the a the first nine weeks like okay you know what we know you can play this hard for checking hockey we know that you know you can sort of be this physical presence but you can do that and produce offense so it's just been a little it's something to keep an eye on kind of as we move on down the stretch Another player that we want to keep our eye on who showed up big time is Philip Forsberg. Philip, show me the money, Forsberg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had his 200th career goal in the game last night. Uh, phenomenal shot. Loved that goal. Um, Philip Forsberg is a man possessed right now, Nick. What, what do you think is going right with him? Uh, he sees that his contract's up at the end of the year. <laughs> you know Let yeah. me cash in on that uh, that nine and a half million 
that I'm reportedly going after. Uh, yes. Do that. And it's working because uh, Philip Forsberg is on pace for the best year of his career. Mm -hmm. And if he continues at this current pace, uh, there are a couple of Preds records in jeopardy. Uh, he's on pace right now for 47 goals. Yes. Would be by far the most ever in a single season for the Nashville Predators. Uh, Victor Arvidsson, it's 34, is the record. Uh, so not only would Forsberg be the first guy to top 40 goals, uh, he would absolutely set a new pace for Predators. Uh, yes. He's also on pace for 77 points, which would be yeah. second all time on the list of uh, single season points for the natural predators behind Paul Correa. Although we should say Roman Yossi is on pace for 82. So, you know, maybe, maybe a couple of layers of history there. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we've seen this play from Forsberg so, so many times Yes, over the past six years. It was just always frustrating because it seemed like either he would get cold in spots mm -hmm. um, or, you know, unfortunately, like injuries would kind of derail some of his momentum. Um, we thought that might happen this year, but he has actually stayed strong. In fact, I would say, argue he's played better since he came back uh, yes. from that month long injury. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, this is this is always the type of player we knew Forsberg was because we've seen him be this player before. It's just that this year he's managed to stay more consistent. And I think that's been the big key. Yeah, he's been much more consistent. And, you know, you kind of also have to factor in he missed, what, 13 games? So imagine well, what his – yeah, so imagine what his stats would be had he been in these games. And I agree with you. I think the key right now for Philip Forsberg and what is so impressive is his consistency. You know, like you've said, we've seen these glimpses, but he has been able to dial in this season. And I think part of that is his line mates. I think when you've got Mikhail Granlin and Matt Duchesne, who also is really dialed in and is playing very consistent hockey, I think really great things are happening in that top line. And Philip Forsberg is going to net some serious profit off of the play of that top line as they look ahead. Yeah, uh, there's going to be raises, raises all around. Um what if you're the if you're David Poyle, mm -hmm. what is your contract offer to him? Because it's certainly probably more than the eight million that Duchesne and Johansson are getting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you pay him more than Roman Yossi's? Do you pay him like at Roman Yossi's? I mean, if you look here, first of all, you can't do 8 million because that number is a, is a whole trigger thing in Nashville. So I don't care okay. if it, <laughs> I don't care if it's 7.99 or 8.01, don't pay him 8 million. But, you know, I really feel like Philip Forsberg is, you know, he's still plenty young, got a lot of good years ahead of him. I am not opposed to paying him Roman Yossi like numbers. Now, my my thing would be let's not let's not do you know a super long term but um you know pay the man pay the man the money pay him the money jerry okay. mcguire full out that's right well you know speaking of money we do want to talk about our friends at bet online where if you're interested in making some money probably not philip forsberg like numbers but hey you never know, never know. Uh, you might want to check out our friends at bet online there may be less football going on right now but bet online has way more stuff that you can bet on this playoff season from scores, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, Bet Online is a number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. And with the new year, of course, comes their new updated desktop and their mobile website. You can go to either one of those and sign up today to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. All you have to do is use our promo code locked on and to, it'll get you started. And it is not, of course, just football. You know, our friends at Bet Online have basketball, of 
course they have hockey. They have boxing, they have UFC, and they have all of your favorite Vegas casino games. It's your number one online wagering site. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and play your favorite games. Bet online where the game starts. Well, let's start to hand out some cookies, shall we, Anne? I feel like we really should. Now, late games this week, so which meant late baking, but of course I always get this done. You know, and I would love to have just some real big surprise, you know, baking award to bestow on someone. But let's face it, you know, when it comes down to cookies, you give the cookies to the to the player who earns them. And this week we were just talking about it. I'm actually going to give them to Philip Forsberg. You know, David Poyle may hesitate to pay him a lot of cash, but I am willing to cook and bake a lot of cookies. So keep that in mind, Philip Forsberg. Uh, just a phenomenal season he is having. 200th career goal, which is a great milestone. And again, like Nick was talking about, we project him to continue, barring injury, knock on wood, project him to continue to have a record-setting pace. So this week, Philip Forsberg, you know, David Poyle will hopefully give you the money, but take heart, my friend. Yeah. I'm giving you the cookies. Yeah, you can't find that in Toronto or Calgary. It's Philip. a family recipe. Like if you want Duchess cookies, you pretty much have to stay here or you could go to Pittsburgh, but I would never yeah. let you do that. <laughs> uh, can you imagine a uh, no. reaction in Nashville if Philip Forsberg goes to Pittsburgh? Oh, I I would take, you know, as they say in the olden days, I would take to my bed with the vapors if that worse, happens. <laughs> worse than Suter by far. Oh, oh, the ultimate. I mean, just you would just wreak betrayal in Bridgestone Arena forever. Yes. Oh, they, he would be public enemy number one. Absolutely. Yes. Or Chicago. like Also not acceptable. Either of those two places, uh, you are going to see riots in Nashville if that yeah. happens. Yes, oh. there, yes. Let's there will not be pillaging. Let's not think about it. Uh, kind of a weird schedule for the Predators coming up. They don't have a game this weekend. Uh, their next game is Tuesday mm -hmm. at Bridgetown Arena against the Vancouver Canucks, another team that's kind of weird right now. Yeah. Uh, then they have a full week off. And then on February 9th, they, uh, they go at the Dallas Stars. This is when they start to make up. Some okay. of those games that were uh, canceled by COVID. Uh, they also have uh, some other games like Washington in that time frame that were moved from later in the season so the NHL can get scheduling. So, um, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting into a weird stretch here. And uh, as we head towards the Olympics, uh, yeah. where it's just, you know, kind of a lot of weird games spread out. Um, you know, kind of like one at home, one on the road, on a random road trip, another one at home. So, you know, what, what's your key to kind of navigating this next month for the Nashville Predators? Um, I think Matt Duchesne said it really well in his post-game uh, media comments last night. They were asking about, you know, they have four days off. This is, you know, a, an anomaly at this point in a hockey season. Um, and he said the key is rest. And I think you really see that these guys have really poured themselves into this season. I think they are invested. I think physically they're playing a really physical, difficult game. And I think the key to this kind of odd schedule is going to be them really maximizing rest and recovery. Now, there's a very fine line with that you know, between resting and recovery and still kind of keeping that uh, the feel of the game. So it's going to be really interesting to see how not just the Nashville Predators, but a number of teams react to sort of this February schedule that's going to be a little more spread out and a little bit off. That's my take on it. I don't know. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be wonky for sure for a lot yeah. of teams uh, because you don't really have any sustained flow. You know, mm -hmm. like sometimes when you go on a road trip, you, you're kind of into the routine. You're on the road for four games, you know, a week. But, you know, it's city to city. You know, you're on kind of the same time schedule. Uh, this is like very spotty. Like you're like I mentioned, you're going to go to, you know, the West Coast one day and then fly back to Nashville four days later and then back out 
uh, for another road trip a couple of days later. So uh, from that end, it's going to be interesting to see how teams can kind of keep up their routine. Yes. Uh, because routine is huge in hockey, um, whether that's something like the players want to admit or not. But you kind of want to keep like your same in-season flow throughout. And this is going to be a challenge to that, not just for the Predators, but – everybody in the nhl and it kind of comes at a weird time too because the trade deadline is the second week of march i believe Mm -hmm. um so you know you're gonna have a lot of teams trying to assess where they are um while also trying to navigate you know kind of a weird schedule where you have to stop and say okay is this slide because we're kind of out of our rhythm a little bit or are we starting to kind of realize what team we are uh, so it's going to be a challenge and it's going to be interesting to see come maybe like March 1st or 2nd, um, how teams kind of assess where they're at. Yes. And I think you, you know, you almost have to take some of these next games with a little bit of a grain of salt, not that Nashville can afford to drop any of them or dismiss them. But I do think that there is something to this wonkiness. There's something to this schedule. And I think I agree with you. I think uh, it's going to be a little more difficult to pinpoint exactly where these teams are when it comes time for the trade deadline. And I think that spills over into players as well. You know, these last you know, this last month of player evaluations, who do you need? Who do you need? You know, what do you need to fill in? It's going to be a little tricky. So, you know, they've got their work cut out for them over this break for sure. Yeah. Well, as we mentioned, uh, no game this weekend, but that doesn't mean we're short on content for next week. Uh, Monday, we have our plus minus. Uh, We're going to be talking about what's gone well for the Predators and what needs some work. So stay tuned for that. Also, a hot take Tuesday that's coming up in the pipeline as well. Plus uh, Anne has uh, some Olympic talk coming up. So another big week ahead for us, uh, even though the predators don't play a lot, there's still plenty to look forward to here on the lockdown predators podcast. In the meantime, Anne, where can the fine people find your work online? You can find my work at on the and you can find me on Twitter at Ann K underscore mama on ice. You can find me at on Twitter at underscore NS Morgan. Be sure to follow the show also at LO underscore Predators. Let us know if there's ever a topic you want us to discuss or if you have thoughts on anything we brought up in the show. Would love to hear your uh, Lord of the Rings versus Pirates of the Caribbean uh, <laughs> thoughts. I'm sure we're all very excited to hear that. In the meantime, though, that's going to do it for us here on the Locked on Predators podcast. Thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you back here on Monday.